All right, so welcome to postpartum nutrition and breastfeeding. Um, my name is Sarah Rubin, and I'm so excited to be here with my dear friend, Lisa Vindero, <laughs> who's also an amazing lactation consultant. Um, and she's going to tell you her own bio, but just quickly about myself. Um, I'm the founder of Rooted Wellness, and my practice is a private practice that focuses on nutrition counseling from fertility, preconception, through the prenatal period, into postpartum and some early childhood. So kind of covering that whole transition to motherhood. Um, so this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart also because I have two young kids. Um, I have a five and a half year old boy and a two and a half year old girl. So definitely in the throes of all this fun stuff. And um, yeah, Lisa, do you wanna tell a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so my name is Lisa Bindero. Um... I am a lactation consultant. I approach lactation support in sort of, I like to think of it in a balanced way where I'm supporting moms through all their choices, whether it be breastfeeding, bottle feeding, figuring out some combination of the two, um, navigating those initial weeks where you're figuring out supply, uh, figuring out if you need to supplement and doing it from a place with like zero judgment and just helping moms kind of achieve um, their goals and help them get to where they want to go. Um, and I have a daughter, I have a four and a half year old, and I have a baby that's about, I don't know if you can see, but it's about 10 weeks from um, arriving. And I'm super excited to get back into the weeds of breastfeeding to remind myself uh, how diff like how, how tough it can be in the beginning. Um, I, I, I know it'll help me serve my clients and the moms I work with even, even better. Awesome. All right. So, um, just to give a little spiel first thing, um, so we're going to be sending this session, basically talking about postpartum nutrition, everything, lactation, all those questions. Um, for me, I love this subject because, you know, just like in pregnancy, you can make such a huge difference on your baby's health through nursing. And you provide so many nutrients that the baby can use, especially DHA, which is a type of omega-3 healthy, uh, healthy fat. Um, and basically healthy fats can help your baby's cognitive development. So you're helping your baby's brain actually develop, which is incredible. Um, there are other things that are present in breast milk, like calcium and vitamin A and vitamin C, all the B vitamins. So that's really incredible. And also the fact that breast milk is dynamic and it changes as your baby's needs change. So you're really fueling your baby's nutrition and helping them have the most optimal start possible. And so um, I think it is a beautiful thing if you can do it. Um, so yeah, Lisa, do you wanna talk a little bit about like your philosophy? When it comes to lactation? Um, so the one thing that I just try to impart on everyone that I work with is that milk supply is a, is, is a supply, uh, like supply and demand situation where the more you ask your body to make, the more it will make. And that's really the best way to increase supply. So what's really fun when Sarah and I get to work together and when we, when we get to do these talks together is we get to talk about like how nutrition affects your supply and what you can do to improve your supply, both from like a physiological standpoint and from a nutrition standpoint, um, you'll get to hear from both of us. So like Sarah was talking to you about the components of the breast milk and how important they are. So like I, my job is to tell you like how to get your supply up um, and, and that's really taking milk out of your body. So I always like to remind everyone that we're talking to like the more milk you take out, the more frequently you take milk out the more that your body will make. Um, and that's sort of like the, the big thing I like to touch on for everyone that I'm working with or talking to about, about breastfeeding. Um, and is there anything like, you know, what, um, cause I know that like the degree of emptiness in the breast um, can drive breast milk fat content. Can you, can you speak to that at all? And like, how that drives that. yeah so sometimes yeah so sometimes so uh, the hind milk the milk that comes out last is the fattiest milk 
And the more frequently we take out milk, the fattier the milk gets. So sometimes I see that moms will be like, oh, but the volume was so high if I waited five hours before uh, nursing or pumping. But the fat content of that milk is actually quite lower. The volume may be higher, but calorically it's much lower. So the, the emptier the breast, the higher the fat content of the milk. Awesome. Um, great. So I would love, you know, we, we can start taking some questions now, um, and, and kind of fill in the gaps. If that sounds good to you, Lisa, but um, yeah, we definitely have some like frequently asked questions that we always get that we can answer for people that kind of always pop up for us. Totally. Um, why don't we talk about alcohol? Because I feel like alcohol yeah. and caffeine are the big ones. and Because and it's cocktail like- hour and you're probably <laughs> drinking right now. <laughs> it's definitely past five o'clock. I don't know about you. My kids are supposed to be going to bed right now. So <laughs> hopefully my husband is not drinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a little bit from a nutrition standpoint, um, alcohol that's consumed by mom passes quickly into the breast milk. And peak breast milk levels are usually reached about 30 to 60 minutes after alcohol consumption or 60 to 90 minutes if taken with food. So food slows the um, absorption of alcohol. Um, I really recommend to most to my clients to drink in moderation. So, you know, making sure that you have alcohol free breast milk saved up for the occasion can sometimes be helpful, but there's no such thing as pumping and dumping. Like you literally have to have your body, you have to give your body time to process the alcohol in your bloodstream. You can't like dump your breast milk and suddenly have alcohol free breast milk. So what do you tell your clients about, about alcohol? So I always, for me, I think it's always with all, all questions from all clients. I always want to find out first, like how old the baby is, because I do think on some level, I'm a little bit more protective over a five day old versus a five month old because of their ability to process the alcohol. It does go, as Sarah said, the alcohol does go into your breast milk. Um, I, I like totally agree with the, you know, the peak levels re- are reached 30 to 60 minutes after alcohol consumption, um, or 60 to 90 with food. Um, the re- the reality I find with most moms is like, you can't drink that much right after you have a baby because you haven't been drinking for nine months. Even if you've been like having a sip of wine here and there, you haven't really been drinking. So you're going to find that even if you try to have a half a glass of wine, you're, you're probably going to feel drunk. Um, maybe like there, <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that we tell new moms is if you're going to drink, make sure you drink either while you're nursing, which like doesn't sound fun. So like removing that as an option, uh, immediately after you nurse, because hopefully you're not going to nurse again for two to three hours. And then the other thing that you can do that I've had some clients do is like, if you pump an ounce that you break that into three, so a third, a third, a third and mix it with milk that is not um, like been tainted by alcohol. And then you're diluting the amount of alcohol into it. Again, like it depends on the age of the baby. It depends on how much you drank. It depends on how much time has passed. There's, and everybody's body metabolizes alcohol differently as I'm sure a lot of you guys know. So um, use common sense on some level, but if you're drunk, if you feel like you wouldn't drive a car, if you feel like, you wouldn't, like if you stand up and you're lightheaded or dizzy, I would pass on nursing and either wait or pump out the milk and, and dispose of it and wait till the next session. Yeah, great advice. Um, the other thing that I get a lot of questions on is caffeine because yeah. that's always a big one, especially when you're sleep deprived with a newborn. Um, generally, most women can tolerate up to three cups. So about like 750 milliliters, if you're being scientific about it, um, but consider caffeine from all sources. So you can get caffeine in coffee, but also tea, some over the counter medicine has ca- caffeine in it. Um, chocolate, there are lots of different sources of caffeine. So even like green tea can sometimes have significant amounts of caffeine. So taking that into consideration and then, you know, watching your baby. So if your baby is more fussy or has, um, alterations in their sleep wake pattern, that's something to think about. Um, when you're, when you're taking into account all your caffeine sources, um, 
okay, we're getting two. I want to get to two questions that we've gotten so far. So the first one is it's super painful in my baby five weeks nurses. So I use nipple guard. How do I wean him off? Do I have to wean him off? Does it affect my milk production? Yeah. So that's a really good question. Um, the number one thing to address is like, why is it hurting you so much? Is it because the lat the latch isn't working? And then we can make this a dynamic conversation. And I know you guys can hear us talking and then write. So like, um, you know, but the first thing I would want to see is why is it hurting you? Is it because the latch is something's off with the latch? Is it because there's something going on uh, with the baby or with your supply that's creating this pain, right? Because it shouldn't be painful. It's definitely like an adjustment in the first week. I always say it's like a new pair of shoes where you'll get like, you know, that like initial blister, but then you should be able to wear those shoes every single day. You're wearing them all day, every day. Um, I love that analogy. I know. <laughs> that's a great analogy. Um, <laughs> It's like those shoes that you've been worn a million times and you put on and they still give you a blister. Like there's something wrong there. They don't fit you. So the latches is the same way. Um, so first I would want to figure out why the latch isn't working, but as far as using the nipple shield, it does, it is a barrier between you and the baby. So the hormonal exchange and like the exchange of saliva is limited. It can affect how much the baby transfers milk, how much milk that the baby's, tra you know, transferring. And it can also, affect your supply. Now, that being said, like I have latches, I have a, a shields in my bag. I bring them to every single consult because I know sometimes they're necessary. Like they are a bridge when latching isn't working, but they just, to the idea that you're going to use them forever is not ideal. Um, yeah. as far as removing them, you can, if you, if, if you remove them and you're feeling a lot of pain, then I would address it. But just to answer the question about removing them for those of you who are just trying to pull it out, like we like to say, it's like the tablecloth trick, like get them on, get them nursing and then kind of pull it out in the, like in the middle of the feeding or once they're going and the milk is let down and then try to see if they'll get back on. Um, some people find doing it in the middle of the night works really well because the baby's kind of sleepy and they're kind of like out of it. It's easier to trick them into latching without, if your baby will not latch without a shield, then there's more going on there that needs to be looked at. Um, that's great actually. And I want to say this from a personal standpoint, like yeah. Lisa actually really helped me with this exact issue. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was nursing my, my daughter, um, who's now two and a half, but, literally like my nipples were bleeding. It was awful. And it, it helped to have the nipple guard in the beginning while my, my, your, cause your breasts actually do need to toughen up a little bit, like your nipples, yeah. toughen up, which sounds like, Ugh. but they do need to like get used to it, even with their second child. So, um, it helped in the beginning for sure, but definitely like once it was, once the nipples had healed and there weren't any cuts on them, then I was able to remove it. And it was, it was much easier. Um, okay. We have a question on why am I craving more sugar? Hmm. Great question. So breastfeeding, you burn a lot of calories. You burn 500 additional extra calories every day, just metabolizing your metabol metabolism is working over time to create breast milk. So a lot of times if you're not feeding yourself enough, like healthy fats and enough lean protein and things that are going to tell your body that you're getting solid nutrition you, and not enough carbs also, because you need those two. Um, you can sometimes crave sugar, especially like at that three to four o'clock afternoon slump, or even in the evening, because your sugar is a sign of, you know, an evolutionary sign. Like we crave sugar to get more calories. So if you're not eating enough, and especially if you're not eating foods like healthy fats that, that give a signal to your body that you're getting those calories, then you may be craving more sugar. And so what I would do is trying to incorporate at every meal, some source of lean protein or healthy fat and making sure that you're getting complex carbohydrates like quinoa, brown rice, whole wheat pasta, um, whole wheat bread throughout the day in, in small, you don't need to like go overboard, but definitely getting a little bit at each meal to make sure that your body feels fueled that you're getting in the nutrition that you need. And don't forget to have snacks. So trying to go, try to go, don't try, don't try to go without eating for longer than four hours. It's kind of the window where your blood sugar starts to plummet. And by the way, you might also find that like you get super hungry and it hits you really hard when you're nursing. 
And usually it hits around that like three or four hour mark from the, your last meal or snack. So just trying to get regular meals and snacks and making sure you're fueling your body because you, you really are like working overtime to nurse. Um, okay. When, what age of baby do you recommend introducing a bottle with pumped milk and or formula to start the weaning process and enable others to help feed your baby? So this one is also dependent on how breastfeeding is going for you. Um, I know many lactation consultants recommend waiting like three to four weeks before introducing a bottle. Typically, I don't. I, I don't say that. I kind of like to see where the supply is at. So there's a lot of um, talk around like quote unquote nipple confusion, but the actual issue is something called flow rate confusion. Milk from a bottle comes out much faster than milk from a breast. And there's much less negative pressure required, be, negative pressure being a vacuum. So it requires the baby to suck harder when they're on you and they don't have to suck as hard on a bottle. So it's easier for them to eat, which is actually not what we want. We want them to work all these muscles in their jaw and in their throat. So when breastfeeding is that well established, that's when I like to introduce bottle. And for some people that's five days. And for some people that's five weeks, as far as, uh, switching to pumping and bottle feeding or formula feeding, like when do I recommend it? It's, it, that's really a personal decision. The, a, the AAP recommends six months, the who recommends two years, which is because of the like world access to clean water. Um, I think going back to work gets really tricky. It's, it's really a personal decision on when you're going to flip over. Um, but as far as introducing a bottle, I like to do it. I personally like to do it within the first two weeks, as long as breastfeeding is well established and it's going well. I sometimes find that if people wait from four or five or six weeks, they can run into a problem where baby just won't take a bottle. Great. Um, okay. So is mercury, eating fish with mercury, high mercury still a concern while breastfeeding? Yes. So you can definitely pass um, heavy metals into your breast milk. Um, so it's kind of the same rules apply as when you were pregnant. So avoiding bigger fish like swordfish or bluefin tuna, you can definitely still have like light canned tuna. That's fine. You can even do that once a week. But anything that's like a big fish like that, I would probably avoid for now until the baby's, especially, especially until the baby's a little bit older, you know, if the baby's like six months to a year, you probably do it like once a month or once every two weeks and be fine. Um, but it's definitely, especially when the baby's brain is just beginning to develop, I really take a more cautious approach with that. Okay. Um, are there any- That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't realize yeah. that. That's super interesting. No, it's still, I know it's such a bummer. I'm like, you just have I'm like what do you mean? I thought I could have sushi like the whole month of February. I was planning on eating sushi and now you're telling me I can't. You, you probably, you could have sushi. You probably could have like a piece of a tuna sushi. Okay. Fine. I would not go overboard on like your tuna of gari <laughs> And for all of you out there, Sarah and I work in an office together. So she's really knows, she sees, I can't, I can't cheat because she sees what I'm eating. That's true. That's true. Although I'm not the nutrition police by any means, I eat everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay. Are there any negative effects to having introduced a bottle early on, say at the one to two week mark? This is kind of piggy, piggybacking on your earlier yeah, it's a really good question. So, and I was just talking to a client about it today. So the negative of introducing a bottle between one and two weeks is that the milk comes out so much faster from a bottle. And when that happens, the baby becomes less and less interested in the breast or can become, there's no, you know, there's no like definite, this is what's going to happen, but a baby can become less and less interested with breastfeeding, the more bottles that they have. There's something called paste bottle feeding. You can look it up. Uh, you can Google it, paste bottle feeding. And I think we can put things in the chat. So maybe I'll try to do that in a minute. Um, there's a great, a uh, uh, demonstration of it on a website called mamanatural.com. They have, she has a video. It's like a three minute video that you can watch. And it basically talks about nursing, uh, feeding the baby, baby's vertical bottles horizontal, and it slows down the flow rate of the bottle. And it, this is like the most important thing when, and this is what can affect 
like it being like a bad introduction of the bottle. So it's not so much important to me about when it happens, it's about like how it happens and how frequently it happens. Again, like some lactation consultants will say four weeks. Like I don't, I don't say that because I like to say if breastfeeding is going well and you want to do it at one or two weeks, like let's do it, but let's just do it uh, in a way that is controlled and that we know isn't going to cause an issue for the baby and for you. That's so helpful. All right. There's a question on how do you recommend balancing weight loss goals postpartum with the hunger and fuel needs that come with breastfeeding? So I have a lot of clients that struggle with this. And to be honest, everyone is so different with their, their, how their body reacts postpartum and how like hormonally they handle the breastfeeding stage. So what I would first say is please don't even start to think about weight loss until like six weeks to almost like two months. I really don't start seeing clients until then because I really recommend like trying to take a non stressed out approach to weight loss. Um, and really, I know it's so hard because like the minute that the baby comes out, you're like, oh, I want to get into my skinny jeans right away. I want to feel like myself again. The truth is like, you're still nursing. So you're not really going to feel like yourself for a little while. And that's okay. Like, I think as with anything, pregnancy and postpartum, it's all about like relinquishing a little bit of the control and letting like your body do what it needs to do. Um, that being said, you can definitely balance your weight loss goals with the hunger, hunger and fuel needs. The biggest thing I, and I mentioned this earlier is really thinking about feeling yourself like an athlete. So really every three to four hours trying to get something in your body so that your body doesn't feel like it, first of all, you don't get too hangry and make poor deci nutrition decisions because that always happens when you're starving, you just reach for whatever's available. And so like staying on top of your hunger and having a pro being proactive about it is a much more successful strategy than being reactive. Um, I really feel like being healthy is nine, 90% of it is really just having a plan. So, you know, if that involves even taking the time on a Sunday night and just like, or anytime, you know, you're going to be with the baby for the, in the beginning, but thinking about like where you're getting your food from having some sort of postpartum plan and, and process, you know, if you don't like to cook or you, or you have the time in the post in the third trimester, try like doubling up on recipes and freezing half. That's something that can be really great. Having some, you know, takeout places that, you know, you can get healthy options on speed dial, really thinking about like, what is going to, how do you're going to fuel yourself for each meal that day so that you have a plan and you're not just reaching for whatever is available and, and trying to get healthy options in your pantry too. So like easy meals and snacks, things that you can eat with one hand, you know, an apple or a banana with nut butter, some some bone broth is also a really good one to just like help you keep you full and also give you some minerals and, and whatnot. So just making sure that you're doing that and also recognizing that like the weight loss comes in, in bits and spurts. It's not like one bell curve down. So there will be weeks and even a month where you don't lose any weight and then all of a sudden you lose five pounds. Um, so just trying to be a little patient with yourself. I know it's so hard, but that's, that's, my advice for that. Um, at least and that's do weight it loss in general, right, Sarah? Yeah. Like weight loss in general works like that, yeah. right? Where like, yeah. if you want to lose five pounds, it's not like you just every yeah. week lose a pound. Like it just all of a sudden comes off yeah. like yeah. at the end of the month, right? Yep. Like, yeah. <laughs> and then it comes up again when you're getting your period. And then it comes back. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's a downward trend if you're, yeah, yeah. If that's your goal, but And then yeah, you go I on think... vacation and then in... <laughs> I think also just like not beating yourself up about it too, because that always backfires and also cortisol, it does impact your ability to lose weight. So when you're all stressed out, your body's in fight or flight mode. It's not really thinking about, you know, I can start processing some of these fats that I'm eating and actually lose weight. Um, okay. Let's take a look at some more questions. Um, someone's doing a few weeks and was wondering how long does it take for your milk to come in with a vaginal birth and also with the C-section at what point should you supplement with formula? If at all, how can you help your milk come in faster? So typically it takes around three to five days for milk 
to come in. So when babies day between the day three to day five with a vaginal birth, and then with a C section, it can be later. It can be up to seven days. Um, at what point should you supplement with formula is very specific to each baby. Um, but they, at the hospital, they will talk to you about what, how many, uh, duty diapers you should be looking for, how many P diapers you should be looking for. It's five, five poos, five on five on five. So five on day five. Um, you can help your milk come in faster. The best way to get your milk to come in faster is after birth to do immediate uh, continuous and uninter uninterrupted skin to skin. So the baby comes out of you, whether it's through a C, C birth or through a vaginal birth, um, you want that baby on you. And even with the C birth, they, they, you know, depending on what, how, what happened, they can generally try to put the baby near you. Uh, vaginal birth, you want that baby on you and be your own advocate. Like with the nurses and the doctors, they're going to say to you like, oh, we have to take the baby for a bath. Like baby doesn't need a bath. Like that's, there's things that they do need the baby for checking vitals, making sure they're breathing, all of those things. Yes. They don't like need to have a bath. They're not like going out to dinner. So, um, get that baby on you, do as much skin to skin as you can and try to get latch to happen right away. And all the, pretty much all the hospitals, there's a lactation consultant who works there. So ask for lactation consultant before you need them, because you don't know when they're going to be there and when they're going to be able to see you. So you want them to come and see you and you just keep asking them to see you as much as you need them in the hospital and it's free. So like get the help. Um, so all these like little things in those first 48 hours, skin to skin, getting the LC in the hospital to help you nursing frequently, hand expression can be really helpful in getting the milk going. When your baby's born, the, the um, stomach is the size of a cherry. So imagine it's like, you know, like this big. So they only need like 10 milliliters, uh, which, which is like this much. I mean, it's like less than this. So that's how much milk they need. So it's not like you need to be like pouring out milk when they're born. Like these pictures of, of uh, milk uh, things on Instagram, like that's so unrealistic. I wish people would stop posting them. Like you're maybe going to make an ounce uh, in each pumping session, the first week the baby's born, that's all your baby needs. So skin to skin, ask for the lactation consultant in the hospital, uh, nurse frequently and often. And before the baby's crying, that's a late, uh, stage sign hunger cue before they're crying, you want to try to feed them and remember that they don't need that much milk to fill them up. Their, their bellies are teeny tiny right in the beginning. Yeah. Um, what's the sign that the baby, that just out of my own curiosity, what's the sign yeah. that the baby's not getting enough milk? So you'll see for, they won't be peeing and pooing enough. The, the pee will be, it depends on the age, right? So we want their, when they're born, their, their, um, their duty comes out like black and then it should transition from black to green to yellow. So we want to see that transition happen. And in the hospital, they'll help you look for that. You want to see wet diapers. You want to see that their lips aren't dry. You want to see that there's no crystallized, like, like it would imagine it would look like, um, like pee when, if it dried and crystallized in the diaper, yeah. that's a sign of dehydration. Um, also like they're, sleeping more too, like, yeah. So that's, what's tricky. A lot of people like, are like, oh, my baby's so good. They sleep so much the first three days. Like, no, you need to wake them up and feed them every two to three hours. Babies sleep, but like, you need to wake them up and feed them to make sure that they're passing through all of this stuff to keep their blood sugar elevated, to keep their cortisol levels low. Uh, you don't want to just let them sleep. You need to nurse them every two to three hours. Right. Um, so there's a question. I can tell my baby is sensitive to dairy, but a dairy-free, soy-free diet is hard. Any advice or recommendations would be appreciated. First of all, I would say as a little asterisk here, like, you may think that your baby is allergic to, you may suspect that it's sensitive to dairy or soy. I would definitely talk to your pediatrician though, before making any diagnoses that involves eliminating things from your diet, because it might be unnecessary. And sometimes what you think is them being allergic to something or sensitive to something is actually like 
them being gassy. I mean, you have to think about baby stomachs are completely sterile when they come out of the womb. So they have to be repopulated or populated, not repopulated, completely newly populated <laughs> with healthy bacteria. So they typically go through a really gassy phase, especially like six to eight week mark, the six to eight week mark, which is totally normal and is expected because their stomachs have to get used to the outside world and all the different bacteria that they're being confronted with. That being said, if you do think, if your baby does have an actual dairy sensitivity, you usually will probably see like blood in the stool, um, but definitely have your pediatrician give you that specific advice first. And then I would say going dairy-free, Dairy free is actually a lot easier now nowadays because there's so many non dairy options. There's like almond milk and oat milk and um, all sorts of non dairy cheese. You can use nutritional yeast as a cheese supplement um, supplement of oh, substitute. Sorry, it's it's a late night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like where are my words at eight o'clock at night? Um, there's a lot of availability of different types of non dairy options. That's a relatively easy one. And then just asking a lot of questions. So it's okay to be that annoying person at the restaurant that asks if there's like dairy in the butternut squash soup. It's okay. Soy is actually a really much harder one to get completely removed because it's actually in a lot of things that you wouldn't think it is, including like some over-the-counter medicines. Um, there's a lot, there's soy in, in lots of things. So I would just try to cook more on your own. Um, so that way you can control what's actually going in your food and then just ask questions and also be really good at being a sleuth at nutrition labels and, and actually looking for like anything with soy in it is usually is, is, is a sign that there's soy in that product. Um, and anything that has milk, even if it's like partially, you know, hydrogenated, whatever milk that it, and also like milk and soy are common allergens. So they usually will have that on the label too, that this product contains milk and soy or milk and tree nuts there. So they, you have to just be get really good at reading labels too. But yeah, it, it's luckily like the non-dairy stuff is a lot easier. Soy less so, but you will, you'll get there. Um, okay. Let's get one more in. Okay. Um, when returning to work, should you pump as often as you would breastfeed? as in every two to three hours to maintain fat content in breast milk? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it so pumping at work is so much harder than pumping at home. There's something about it where it's like, you just get into this other place mentally to stop and, and, and pump um, can be tricky. So there are a couple of things I'd like to advise women. Um, yes, you, you don't need to do it every two hours, but I would do it every three if you can. Um, nurse before and after work, if you can, um, and on the weekends, as much as you can, if you're up for it, you know, like if you're just like, I just kind of want to keep this routine of pumping during the day, that's fine. Um, I, I, I think most places in New York have a dedicated lactation space. Um, I really encourage you if you're going to go pump in that space that you take those 15 or 20 minutes to not work. I know it's so hard because you're like, I have like a gazillion emails piling up. So even if you tell yourself for 10 of the 20 minutes that you're going to like, look at the cute pictures from the weekend on your phone of like you, you and your, your child and your family, or like read a magazine or like listen to something, listen to a song that you like. Um, it is important to pump every three hours, but it's more important that you sh shift your body into like a milk producing place. A lot of people supply drops at work because they're not around their baby and your body doesn't like understand what's happening. So the more you can shift your body and mindset into that sort of oxytocin place, which is the feel good hormone. Like maybe it's like, that's when you have your chocolate croissant or that's when you have like your oat muffin or whatever, like treat that you have magazine, I think like magazine music, baby food. Um, and pick one of those things to use at work when you're pumping every three hours, because it will help you to produce more milk. Uh, one other really cool trick that I learned, uh, they did a study at a hospital in the NICU where they had moms cover, like half the moms covered the collection bottles with like little baby socks. And those moms made more milk because I think they were less stressed about how much milk was coming out. They weren't like staring at the bottle. That's so amazing. I think that's like a really interesting trick. 
That's so amazing. I wow. know. Isn't that crazy? Because your cortisol goes up when you don't feel like you're making milk and then it blocks your hormones that make that produce the milk. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you just have your partner give you a foot rub while you're nervous. Yeah. <laughs> when you're home. Um, okay. There's another question on sensitivities and allergies. Is there any evidence that what you eat while pregnant can impact and or potentially reduce the risk of post-birth sensitivities in your baby? Oh, I love this subject because, <laughs> well, sadly, no at the moment. So, but I'll put an asterisk there and say like, there's the wonderful thing about nutrition science is that it's a science. So we're always learning new things and it's a relatively young science. So what we know is constantly changing at the current moment. There's no evidence that su suggests that like avoiding or eating more peanut butter or soy or eggs is necessarily going to affect your baby's likelihood of developing those allergies. The biggest piece of advice I would give you is when you do start to introduce solids to, and this is across the board, what every pediatrician recommends is really early introduction is the key, not avoiding those foods, but actually introducing them in small amounts and, and giving them like a couple of days and then moving on to that next potentially allergenic food and watching your baby for any signs of an allergy. So I know it's scary because everyone thinks, oh my God, like what's, if, what if my baby has a nut allergy and I introduce nuts? It's okay. Most of the time they will have like hives or some sort of reaction if they are actually allergic. It's not like a life-threatening thing during the vast majority of those times, but really early introduction is what can help your baby to develop the immunities necessary to be able to respond to those allergens and not develop food allergies. Um, there is, however, some evidence that eating a healthy diet can actually impact your baby's um, willingness to try those foods when they are starting to have solids. There's actually a study that showed that babies who, mothers who were eating like a lot of carrots and then, um, the babies who their babies basically were attracted to the breast milk that had like a carrot flavor after. So it's kind of priming your baby in utero and also in, in breast milk, you will get some of those flavors too. Um, so eating a healthful diet can actually impact your baby's um, likelihood to want that variety and want different flavors. And so that is one thing that you can do that will really impact your baby in a positive way. Um, okay. When nursing after having burp baby and setting them on their back, if baby spits up, is that a sign to feed them more or did they have too much milk? Um, so first thing I would ask is, is the baby upset when they spit up? Cause like if they just spit up, but it doesn't bother them, then they're probably just regurgitating milk that, that didn't in fact fit in their belly. It's not that they like had too much and you have to worry about it. Um, it's just that they're spitting up a little bit. Um, if they're uncomfortable and they're, uh, crying and they're like spitting up from crying and being gassy, then that's a different story. And that would just tell me either that you, you could hold them upright. It depends on how long you held them up right after, or that they're swallowing air while they're drinking. And then the next question I would have is like, why are they swallowing air? Um, is it from a bad latch or from a bad, like a, like an incorrect bottle feeding technique, um, or something going on with their suck swallow coordination. But if they're like generally happy, like you put them down and they burp or they burp, you put them down and they spit up a little, like, that's fine. That's normal. That's as my friend said to me when I had my daughter, like, that's why they make burp claws. That's why burp claws are a thing because babies spit up. Yeah. So true. And every baby is different too. Like some babies will spit up a lot and some babies won't at all. So that's also, um, okay. All right. One more. Have you heard of power pumping? Do you recommend? I tried today, but didn't notice any major increase in milk and it really hurt my breasts after. Oh, I am sorry to hear that. Um, I have heard of power pumping. Uh, it takes at least five or six days for it to kick in. So like, we like to say like you're placing an order that you'll receive later. Um, so you would have to do it for five, six straight days in a row to really see like an addition in your supply. Um, if your breast really hurt after, then I would be concerned about like the flange. Is it fitting you correctly? Is it, um, 
the suction level too high, you may, if you're doing power pumping, need to lower the suction level so that it's not so aggressive. And then the other thing you can do is you can take um, coconut or olive oil and put it around the bend of the flange where your nipple gets pulled through, like the same way you would put chapstick on your lips. So it's like a very thin, thin layer. And that lubricates the suction, you know, when your nipple's getting pulled through and it'll help a little with the pain, but you're not going to get milk for five days and like it shouldn't hurt you and if it's hurting you you're not going to make milk because then your body's going to be stressed and your prolactin and oxytocin is going to get blocked the hormones that make milk so you need to figure out a way to do it where it doesn't hurt you thanks for that um okay there's another question on is my prenatal vitamin good enough to take after giving birth does a postnatal vitamin need any additional or different vitamins and minerals so yes your prenatal is totally fine to take after giving birth. Um, you don't really need to, your nutrient needs don't really change that dramatically from the third trimester to that immediately postpartum. You know, if you find that you're avoiding certain foods or you are eating less fish, for example, like you might, if your prenatal doesn't have any uh, omega-3 supplement as part of the prenatal, you might want to consider taking that too, just because that is something that you do pass through your breast milk. Um, but yeah, your prenatal is fine. Don't like waste your money and get like a special postnatal vitamin. Like you can just keep on taking what you're taking and just, just keep in mind that like the, the prenatal supplements are really just that they're supposed to supplement a good diet. So really trying to get variety in your diet, getting lots of, you know, fruits and vegetables, getting complex carbohydrates, lean protein, healthy fats, the, at most meals, those are all the the foundations of a healthy diet. And by the way, are also the same foods that will help you heal and also promote a bigger quantity of breast milk because you're getting enough calories. So yes, long about way of answering that. Yes, you can still take your prenatal. Um, Mm. (laughs) um, Okay. A couple more questions. So I've been trying to bottle feed with my express milk and she refuses it, but we'll take it with my mother-in-law, but not, my, but not with my husband or I, she's two and a half months of age. Any tips? That's a really tough one. I, um, I don't know why that would be the case. And I guess my question, my first question would be is like, have you seen your mother-in-law give the bottle and is she giving it in a different way? Um, certainly there are babies who, when they're with their mother, they want to nurse, but it's hard for me to understand why she would do it with your mother-in-law and not, but not with, not with your husband. Um, I wonder, you know, I don't know if you were in the room when the, your husband tried, I'm sure you tried both to be in the room or out of the room. Um, I, and my tips would be for a two and a half month year old, um, would be with the same tips because I don't know what's going on with your mother-in-law. It's the same. I'm going to give you the same tips I give any with that to any mom, any baby that's bottle refusing bottle. Um, let them play with the nipple of the bottle during the day, like have it in their area. So they become very familiar with it. They put it in their mouth. It becomes like something that's not so strange to them. And then the other thing you can do right before you try to give them bottles, you tap around their mouth like this. And it awakens the muscles, their sucking muscles, and kind of shows them how to bottle feed or how to use these muscles so they can bottle feed. And then the other thing you can try is like nursing for like 20 seconds to a minute. And then, and then like, and so we do this sometimes when a baby won't latch, we'll give them the bottle for a minute and then quickly put them on the breast. So I want you to almost do the opposite where you have them on the breast and then you quickly give them the bottle. It's like this, like they're already sucking, they're already eating and you're kind of tricking them into it. So I would try those things and see if that works. But I'd also be curious to see like what your mother-in-law is doing and why that's working. One more, um, when you introduce formula, should it be continuous or could you give on off when needed? So the thing about introducing formula is, Hmm, That's a good question. I mean, I don't think there's a right answer. I think it's sort of like what works for you and your family. Um, I think on off is is my answer. And I'll tell you, it's because I assume that means you're also giving breast milk as well. And as we discussed in the beginning, breast milk is 
specifically made for the age of your baby at that time. So like you're better off using the milk that you have than like not using it and using formula instead, because that milk will then in two months be made for a baby that's two months earlier, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think on off when needed is the right way to go. I don't think it needs to be continuous for any reason. Awesome. Um, okay. We have one other question that I kind of thought would be good to wrap things up with and, and, and definitely, by the way, feel free if you have any other unanswered questions to put some more in the chat, but, um, if you could give a few pieces of actionable advice, nutrition wise and breastfeeding wise to a new mom, what would they be? Do you want to take that first, please? Sure. Or, yeah. I can, I can rattle off. <laughs> no, 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 let me think. Um, actionable advice. Such a good question, by the way. Such a good question. Actionable advice for first time breastfeeding mom. Um, the one we talked about earlier about your milk coming in, someone asked, uh, how can you help your milk come in? So when the baby's born skin to skin, continuous and un uninterrupted, get the support of the lactation consultant in the hospital and get that baby on you as much as possible in those first few days before you get home. That would be like, you know, part one, because that's like the first few days. Then I would say like, once you're home, um, the more milk you take out of your body, the more you're going to make. So try not to listen to like other people's stories. Like, Oh, I slept through the night and then nice, but I still had plenty of milk. Like that's an unusual situation. You need to take milk out at least eight times in 24 hours in that first month that the baby is born. And then also like, I think one of the biggest things is like, if it's not working, get help, like call, go to a La Leche league meeting, call a lactation consultant. I do free uh, assessment calls for people all the time. Like if it's not working, get help. It's like, there's too much going on for you to kind of just suffer in silence. So like, whether it's help with breastfeeding or um, support in your home from family or friends or support because you're having postpartum anxiety, the motherhood center is amazing for postpartum anxiety. Like reach out because there's a whole community out there of people who really want to help you. Yeah, I definitely um, totally agree with that, that support system. Like, especially that's something really good to think about even in your third trimester. And I realize yeah. you're a new mom, so you're not thinking about that, but really establishing like who is going to help you with feeding yourself, who is going to help you when you need a break, like who can you use as a resource, like getting that network together is super helpful. Um, as far as nutrition advice, I really, as I said earlier, like your best defense is a good offense. So really being proactive and, and taking even a second to think about like, well, this is what I'm going to eat today. These are the snacks I'm going to have. Don't be afraid of snacking. Use snacks as a way to bridge from one meal to another. So really thinking about eating every three to four hours, you know, your baby's nursing every two to three hours. So, you know, you can use that as like, when I'm done with my baby, I feed myself you know, so, and you're often pretty hungry actually after nursing sessions, especially in the beginning, but really trying to get in, especially like healthy fats and the lean protein that's going to help keep you satiated at most meals. Um, and then having easy snacks on hand that are, are healthy, like nuts and fresh fruit and nut butter and hummus and carrots and things like that, that are going to, to really give you nutrients and that are nutrient dense and will help keep you satiated. So you're not hangry. Um, great. So someone asked for contact in, info. Lisa's going to, Sarah, should I put your Sarah? At really yes. Well that'd be great. Email? Thank you. I'll do it right now. Um, awesome. And you can also find us also on Instagram too. I'm at rooted wellness NY and Lisa, I think you can just type your name in. <laughs> I'm not good. I'm not, good with that. I'm not so active on Instagram, but um, I will. I will. Find better for Lisa, but you can find me there. Um, and I, we're, we're laughing because it's like a it's an ongoing joke in our office. At least it's like basically because I like somehow I like don't use social media and very clearly probably should, but it's like it overwhelms no, you're, me. You're I'm sure many of you feel like that. overwhelmed by it. I find it very it is overwhelming. overwhelming. <laughs> Um, 
So, but I added, bo I've added both of our email addresses into the chat. And then I also added the paste bottle feeding link, which is a super helpful link for how to bottle feed, even if you're not breastfeeding, because it prevents gas and, re and like, uh, it it's a method of bottle feeding that prevents the baby from getting gas. So it's really super helpful. The other thing that we should mention also, we mentioned at the beginning of the call, but for everyone who joined afterwards, that Lisa and I actually work in the same office space. Yeah. So, and, and there's also a sleep consultant in the same office space. So you can, it's kind of a one and done for postpartum mamas. So if you need help, we are all available and definitely taking in-person clients. So yeah, that is also available to people who are in New York. Um, yeah. And we're also all three moms with kids. So yeah. like reach out to us if you need help, even just if you need like help in some other direction, if you're looking for a mom's group or you need help with something like, I don't know, there's just so many questions and we're, yeah. that's sort of why we do what we do. So like reach out to us, we're here for you guys. Yeah. Uh, someone asked, do we work virtually? We both do work yes. virtually. Um, I mostly see clients in home because I need to see the baby and weigh them and, and like be there to like help with latching. But I also do virtual um, appointments as well. And Sarah does as well. Yeah, yeah, I definitely do virtual appointments. So um, that's no issue because we don't always need to be in person for nutrition yeah, stuff. Yeah, but we kind of all got good with virtual during the pandemic. So we kind of have figured out how to do it if it needs to be done. Yeah, totally. Um, great, if there's no other questions, we're gonna wrap it up. But I just wanna say thank you, Lisa. This was so fun. Thank you to so everyone fun. who joined. Um, please reach out to us if you need anything and thank you Hatch for having this great webinar. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.